Welcome to yet another episode of Game of Thrones Abridged on Alt Swift X. Today we are reading Sansa 2, A Game of Thrones, the second Sansa chapter. And this chapter is set around the tourney of the hand of the king, and Sansa is terribly excited to be seeing all the pageantry and the knights and ladies and jugglers and singing and lemon cakes. This is an exciting day for Sansa Stark, and it begins with her looking out of her litter, out of her little horse-drawn box, with curtains of yellow silk, silk that's so fine Sansa can see right through them. The gold silk turns the whole world gold. Which in itself is a lovely little sort of metaphorical fl thing, uh, because she's seeing through this silk and it makes everything look gold. It's like rose-coloured glasses. It's like an illusion that makes you think that everything is bright and beautiful and wonderful when, as Sansa is soon to find, things kind of aren't. And also, you know, just like the thinness of the silk, it's like, you know, something being gilded. It's like, it's, 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 it's illusory, it's thin, it's, it's insubstantial, it's not real. All this beauty, all this pageantry, it's, it's, it's fake. And underneath, it's, it's rotten, it's burned, like Sandor Clegane's face. But we haven't got there yet. So, uh, so... Sansa's all, oh, she's, oh, the splendor, the beauty, the nights, the blah, blah, blah. It is better than the songs, she whispers. Because she's obsessed with all the songs about all the great nights and all the stories and the tales. The songs is sort of the metaphor that Sansa consistently uses to describe her sort of worldview, her naive worldview. Uh, and, and Sansa goes on about the dress she's wearing. She describes the gown and the green and the auburn of her hair. Uh, dress descriptions are to Sansa what food descriptions are to George, I would say. At any opportunity, Sansa leaps at the chance to talk about dresses and silks and lace. Uh, and then she looks at all the knights that are riding out, the heroes of a hundred songs, the heroic knights of the Kingsguard. <laughs> The Knights of the Kingsguard, who we quickly find through the course of the story, are largely bloody useless, many of them, if not straight up evil. Uh, and she sees Jamie Lannister, and she sees Sir Grigor Clegane, the mountain that rides. And I'll be damned if that's not the best goddamn epith epithet, 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 epithet in the series. The mountain that rides. Wonderful. Uh, and she sees Lord Yon Royce, who wears the bronze armor, thousands of years old, engraved with magic runes. That is one of the more intriguing artifacts in Game of Thrones that we've never seen do anything. I do hope that by the end of this series we'll see bronze Yon Royce's armor do something sick. Maybe it's like defense against White Walkers or something. That would be... That would be nice. Uh, and, and Sansa sees uh, Jason Malister and Thoros of Mir and all these people who just sort of offhandedly mentioned, but who go through pretty dramatic character developments, or at least Thoros does. Jason Malister, well, he's one of the guys who sees Rob's will, which is interesting, and he's currently holed up uh, in his castle at Seaguard, I believe. He probably has some role to play. Anyway, so there's lots of people prancing about, being, ooh, knights, and there's the crowd, and everyone's, ooh, um, and there's lots of minor characters, Balon Swan, Bryce Caron, Sir Roba, Roba the Red, he's one of, uh, Renly's rainbow, rainbow guard at some point, uh, lots and lots of tertiary and ordinary characters. Jane Poole, who's Sansa's friend, confesses that she's a bit frightened by the look of Jalabar uh, Joe. Uh, a prince from the Summer Isles who has a cape of green and scarlet feathers, and his skin is dark as night. What's frightening you, Jane? Is it the feathered cape? Or is it the black skin? Are you a bit racist, Jane? Or do you... or is it... or feather... maybe she's got a feather phobia. I'm sure that's a thing. Uh, and she sees Lord Berwick, and Lord Berwick, of course, looks incredibly handsome, and he's this young, prancing knight with long hair, uh, and Jane Poole immediately falls in love with him, 
and by the end of the series, Beric Dondarrion is a is a much resurrected corpse full of holes who's a who's a fanatical supporter of a god w- waging a waging a guerrilla war against <laughs> against the crown it is always stunning in these early books to see how different people are at the beginning compared to the end um and the girls that the, so they're sitting jane pool sansa stark and septa mordain who's the nun who's overwatching them um, they criticize Jory for Jory's appearance. They say, "Ew, Jory looks like a beggar in his outfit. He hasn't even got any tassels," uh, and 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 that's mean. Uh, Jory's OG. What are you doing? Yeah. Anyway, um, and so and then the jousting begins, and the jousting goes all day, um, and and men are riding at each other very fast on horses with sticks, with the goal of hitting each other off. Uh, sport is dumb, uh, and and every time someone falls off their horse, Jane covers her eyes like a frightened little girl. But Sansa says, "Oh, I'm made of sterner stuff. I I keep my composure when I see something as shocking as a man falling off a horse." Um, so it's kind of a ridiculous thing there that Sansa thinks she's all tough um, by not being upset when people fall off horses in the jousting. Uh, Sansa girl, you're gonna see some worse shit than this real soon. Uh, that, that that's always true naivety though. I mean, it's it's ig- naivety, ignorance. I- I- ign- true ignorance is not knowing how ignorant you are, and true naivety is not knowing how naive you are. So I always like to assume that I am naive and stupid at all times, uh, as a preventative measure, uh, and you should too. <laughs> Uh, and, and then something happens, uh, Hugh of the Vale, so Hugh of the Vale gets killed in the jousting by the mountain, so Gregor Clegane, uh, uh, got a lance right through the throat, uh, and if that won't kill you, I don't know what will, uh, he falls off, and then the, and then the dying young knight falls upon the ground and his lifeblood pours out from his face hole, um, and then for a moment, there's a streak of fire on, on shining on his armor from the sun. But then the sun goes behind a cloud, and it was gone, and Sir Hugh is dead. Which, frankly, I think is a, is a bit precious uh, as an image with the whole sunset, the sun going away, representing Sir Hugh's life. Ebby. I think that's a bit melodramatic myself. Uh, anyway, so Jane Poole weeps hysterically. Uh, and has to be taken away to regain her composure, but Sansa sits with her hands folded in her lap with a strange fascination, because she's never seen a man die before. She should be crying, but the tears do not come. Maybe she'd used up all her tears for Lady and Bran. So, so, Sansa is currently mourning the death of her direwolf lady. Doesn't seem to think about it all that much. She, it seems as though she's enjoying distracting herself with all this tourney, stuff, to not have to think about Lady and and Bran, who was crippled, and all of that stuff, which I suppose is fair enough. Um, So let's not be too harsh. Although she's also thinking, oh, Sir Hugh of the Vale, oh, he's nothing to her. He's some stranger. There will be no song. She she feels sad that no songs will be sung about him, uh, but she thinks Sir Hugh is nothing to him, so she doesn't feel that bad. That's a bit, that's a bit cold. Just, I mean, I wouldn't want to throw around a label like sociopathic, but she d- does seem to give quite a, f- quite, quite few shits about the death of a innocent young man. But whatever. And then, and then, so the jousting's happening, and then so a boy goes, goes up and gets with a shovel to shovel the dirt over the blood stain uh, off the jousting track to cover up the blood. So a little bit like the sort of gold silk. I think this represents covering up. Like using using a using a, a thin shallow uh, disguise to cover up nastiness with a shiny veneer. I think that's what's happening with the dirt here. Uh, and there's more jousting, uh, and then Lord Renly comes out. And when Lord Renly comes out, the Commons cheer wildly because because Renly is a great favorite of the crowds. I don't really know why though. I mean, someone like like Marjorie Tyrell. 
Um, they, they sort of clearly lay out reasons why Marjorie is so, is so popular among the common people, because she goes and she gives out food to the hungry, and she makes herself seen. She goes out on all these trips all the time where she's sort of going out among the common people in lots of different ways and doing lots of nice things. We don't really see any of that with Renly. I mean, we do know that he, he he's very charismatic, and he knows how to put on a show, and he knows how to sort of play the crowd, so I suppose that uh, partly accounts for it, but we don't have much more information than that. Uh, he does have a lovely green piece of armor, though, so maybe that's part of it. Um, and more jousting, more pageantry, more nonsense, more minor characters. Aaron Santagar, Luthor Brune. It's an apple, apple eater. Uh, and then all the jousting comes down to four people. The four uh, uh, most victorious people of the jousting, which is Jamie Lannister, the king, the Kingslayer, Loras Tyrell. Uh, and the brothers Clegane, the Hound and the Mountain. Uh, Loras, by the way, is 16, which again seems rather young. I mean, how old is he by the time he's leading the siege of Storm's End? Like, is it, what, 18, 19 maybe? That's pretty cray, but anyway. Uh, and Sansa has never seen anyone so beautiful as the, as the Knight of Flowers. Uh, and he's got this elaborate armor. It, I think it is good that in the show, the the armor of Loras Tyrell at the tourney was quite elaborate there as well. Uh, they did they did put some money into that uh, costuming, which I thought was nice. He had a nice helmet, uh, but his horse wasn't covered in roses in the show, so. Mm. Uh, that sucks. Uh, and, and so Loras does a whole bunch of stuff, and Loras is giving out flowers every time he wins a victory to all the pretty maidens. Um, and when he wins his last victory, he takes a red flower, which is a special red flower, and he gives it to Sansa Stark. No victory is half so beautiful as you, sweet lady says Loras, giving the flower to Sansa. And of course, Loras is gay. He's playing this crowd of adoring women. Uh, and and he's gay, which seems like a bit of a shame, a bit of a waste, is all I'd say, not to not to condemn anyone for anything. Uh, and But Sansa takes the flower from Loras Tyrell, struck dumb by his gallantry. This is like, this is like a dream come true for Sansa Stark. This is like... Um, one of those one directions giving the given given the given the little snapchat to one of the preteens I, i'm trying to find a modern analogy anyway so sansa gets the flower and she's all excited and then littlefinger a man who sansa does not know littlefinger turns up and goes hmm i am littlefinger uh, and we have a description of littlefinger he's um he's got a silver streak in his hair and he's got a pointed beard uh which Wait, yeah, no, but no, then, then Littlefinger, Littlefinger comes up to Sansa, who he doesn't know, and the first thing he says is, oh, you must be one of her daughters, you have the Tully look, and, uh, and he has grey-green eyes that do not smile when his mouth does, and Sansa's like, ew, uh, I'm Sansa Stark, why are you acting like a fucking weirdo? Uh, and then Littlefinger, um, Littlefinger says, your mother was my queen of beauty once, he says quietly, you have her hair. His fingers brush against her cheek as he strokes her hair. And then he abruptly leaves. Now, it is sometimes said that Littlefinger is less overtly creepy in the books. This is not one of those <laughs> moments. Littlefinger is a fucking worry in this one. Uh, yeah. And I suppose this is probably the moment where Littlefinger first begins his obsession with Sansa Stark, with his uh, creepy fucking vicarious love for her, um, where he's just sort of using her as a stand-in for his childhood crush, Catelyn. Nothing more terrifying than a clever man whose motivation is driven by a combination of, um, uh, well, just frustration and obsession with past slights. A failure to get over your past conflicts is the issue at hand, I think. You gotta get over shit, and you gotta fucking look towards future goals. I, I mean, not to try and give any life advice or anything. Uh, and so Littlefinger's a creep, uh, and then there's 
food descriptions, what you've all been waiting for. There's oryx, there's meat, there's sweet grass, there's strawberries, there's fresh bread, bread, bread. it's butter, herbs, whoa! Uh, and it's great. <laughs> and then, and then they're sitting and they're eating. Um, and, and, and then Sansa sees Joffrey, and Sansa's like, <gasps> shit, because they haven't talked ever since the bad thing happened in Sansa's words since the fight with Arya and and Micah and the death of Micah and the death of Lady uh and so Sansa's all a bit fucked up about that still um but she's doing a bit of mental gymnastics to tell herself that it, none of it is Joffrey's fault she tells herself that it's actually Queen Cersei's fault and it's Arya's fault so if she should hate anyone she should hate Arya and Cersei so that's a bit fucked up she she's 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 trying she's got like this cognitive dissonance where she's like, Oh, uh, I like people who are princes and and queens and pretty. Uh however, I don't like people who cause the death of my dog. Uh how can I reconcile this? Uh well I'm gonna convince myself that Joffrey's innocent, which is bullshit. Uh and and go along my happy way. Uh but 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 you can see there's a bit of a crack at the seams of that logic, you know? Because, because, uh, spoiler, Joffrey is actually a shit. Okay, moving on. Uh, so, but Joffrey is too beautiful to hate. That's, yeah, there's definitely, jo- Joffrey in the show is, is, is great, but, um, he's certainly not as pretty as Book Joffrey. Uh, Book Joffrey is the prettiest girl in the kingdom. Uh, second only to Loras, I would say. Uh, handsome and gallant. And so Joffrey, so Sansa's very trepid, trepidatious. <laughs> What's the word? Trepidation? He, she is very trep, trepid, trepid, trepidy. Tre, 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 she's that. Uh, and, uh, but Joffrey's actually pretty nice. He's pretty pleasant to her. She, he compliments her and he's all pleasant and gives a little stuff, and, uh, and Sansa's so overjoyed that Joffrey's being nice to her, her heart is singing, uh, and, uh, and Joffrey puts out a bit of ridiculous arrogance, he talks about how he's gonna go joust one day, and he's gonna destroy all of the jousters and whatever, um, and, and he gets Sansa to drink, the good old, good old gross, gross boyfriend move, uh, and, and when Septim Ordain looks to, uh, sort of prevent Sansa from drinking, um, Joffrey also fills the cup of, of, of Septim Ordain, which is a smooth move, because it shuts Septim Ordain up. It, if ever a nun gets in your way, pour her a drink. If you ever get cornered by a nun, if you ever need to get out of a tough situation with a member of the faith, just pull pull out pull out a glass, top it up. Just all the all your problems will go away. Trust me, uh, it's happened to all of us. Uh, and so Joffrey is being all nice, and Sansa is so happy. She's drunk on the magic of the night, and she, the singers and the jugglers and and Mo- and Moon Boy, Moon Boy, the the um the the simpleton, the fool is he he he's he's pie faced. He's a pie faced simpleton. I don't even know what that means. Pie-faced. I mean, I, I suppose it means round. But what? Why a pie? Did, did he got? Has he got like a? Has he got like a skin condition? Has he got a crusty face? Has he got a? Has he got a bit of pastry face? Is that what? I don't. What does that even mean? I like. I like. I like it, but I don't. Anyway. But 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 Moon Boy mocks everyone with such deft cruelty that Sansa wonders if he was simple after all. Conspiracy theory, guys. Sansa, at Moon Boy is Varys in disguise. Have you ever seen Moon Boy and Varys in the same room? Didn't think so. Theory confirmed. Um, and Joffrey is being all nice, and it's so great. Uh, and then there's more food <laughs> description: honey and garlic and spinach and plums and and snails. They eat some snails. The hashtag Westeros is France. Uh, lots of food descriptions, uh, Sansa eats many lemon cakes, uh, and then the scene is sort of interrupted by King Robert getting shit-faced. Robert is very drunk, and he's also very angry. He's yelling at the Queen Cersei, and he's saying, oh, You bloody woman, shut your face hole. I, if, if I say I'm gonna fight tomorrow, I will fight. 
And what we find out later, what, what that's all about, is apparently Cersei was deliberately trying to bait Robert into fighting in the melee uh, by telling him not to fight in the melee, because Robert will do the opposite of whatever Cersei says. Because Cersei hoped that by getting Robert to fight in the melee, she could get Robert killed by, um, by just, ha by just I don't know, paying someone to swing a mace wrong and bop, bop him on the noggin. I think that's kind of the plan. Varys says so later. Cersei's, Cersei's been trying to kill Robert for a while, and you've got to wonder what some of her other harebrained schemes have been before the before the boar succeeded. You, uh, you could make a great, like, Mr. Bean kind of comedy about a drunken Robert Baratheon sort of lumbering through life while Cersei schemes in the background trying to have him assassinated through a series of ridiculous Rube Goldbergian contraption machinations which fail every time and, and Robert just sort of Mr. Bean-ly just sort of blunders through it, not even realising that he's a hair breadth from death every, every moment. That would... That, I mean, it'd be like a Tom and Jerry cartoon, like, or like, um, what's tw Tweety Bird? Wh which one? Well, Tweety Bird would be, oh no, I guess Sylvester. I'm not sure who's who in this analogy, because Tweety should probably be Cersei, shouldn't it? Anyway, uh, it's, it's not important. What's important is that Cersei's face looks so bloodless that it might have been sculpted from snow. Cersei is a White Walker confirmed. Uh, and King Robert's being a cunt. Uh, he's very drunk. He's very obnoxious. Um, he pushes over Jaime Lannister, the Kingslayer. Uh, and Jaime just has to say, mm, yes, as you say, he has to sort of cow down to the king, uh, which, uh, sucks. Um, and Joffrey is watching this. Joffrey, of course, thinks that King Robert is his father. And what we sort of learn at this moment is that Joffrey has not had the best parental role models in his life, uh, and that seems to perhaps, perhaps, explain, if not excuse, uh, some of his uh, behaviour and personality. So after Joffrey observes his father the king, uh, not really his father, but who he thinks is his father the king, acting like a rude, aggressive, drunken, obnoxious, irresponsible, uh, prick, uh, Joffrey suddenly gets a queer look on his face, as if he were not seeing at all. Uh, and he and he says, oh, Sansa, do you want an escort back to the castle? And she's like, oh, oh, uh, mm, oh yes, oh, yes, please, oh, take me back in your car to, uh, to, I'll, I'll kiss you on the way home after prom night. It'll be like a teen movie. And then Joffrey's like, uh, lol, JK, I'm actually getting the hound to escort you back to your chambers, and I'm staying here and eating your fucking lemon cakes. Played. Uh, that happens, sort of. Um, and so Sandor takes takes Sansa back to the castle. Um, and, and yes, without even a word of farewell, Joffrey just leaves her. So, I mean, you know, if nothing else, that, that does show a very direct connection between Joffrey seeing the awful behaviour of his parents and him acting weird and cold. Uh, there, there's, there's a link there, which no, I think that's what that's establishing. But anyway, we have a moment... Uh, with Sansa and Sandor. So they're walking back to the castle. He's taking her back. And uh, and the Hound is, um, spoiler, uh, not very nice. Uh, he sort of laughs at her and is mean to her. And, and Sandor has a laugh like the snarling of dogs in a pit. Which seems like a good simile until you think about it. What the fuck does a laugh that sounds like the snarling of dogs in a pit sound like? Like, like, for, what, I, I mean, it gets the point across, but that's, but it's a, it, I think it's just a bit of a bullshit simile. Uh, but, but the beautiful dream ends. So Sansa feels like the, the, the gold silk veil and the, and the dirt covering the blood is sort of stripped away a bit. And by being with the hound, Sansa feels like the spell of the beauty of the song. Uh, kind of drifts away, and the re reality, the burned, gross reality sets in. Because uh, she tries to sort of use her courtesies to sort of defend her against the Hound. She sort of says, Oh, uh, you were very uh, gallant, uh, Mr. Mister Hound, sir. And Sandal's like, Ah, fuck your empty compliments, I don't care. I spit on the vows of knights. Oh. The Hound's kind of emo, I think. 
He's like an annoying emo boy. He's Troy's trying to be all be all subversive and sad. Uh, but anyway, so that's so that's what they're doing. And Sandor's like, "Aren't you a pretty little bird trying to be all pretty and little?" And Sansa's like, "Oh eh, shit, I don't know what to say now." Um, and then <laughs> the Hound gets to talking about his brother, Sir Gregor the Mountain, and he talks about how, "Ooh, Sir Hugh." That wasn't an accident. I think Sir Gregor killed Sir Hugh on purpose, and we sort of are reminded of that mystery of why Sir Hugh died. Did Cersei tell Gregor to kill Hugh? Although, on the other hand, like the apparently the reason why he was killable is because Sir Hugh's gorget wasn't fastened on properly. So, I mean, if that was just by chance, maybe there was just an opportunistic element to the death of Sir Hugh. Maybe it was just a spur-of-the-moment thing, and no one was behind it. Who the fuck knows? Um, anyway, so the Hound gets all worked up and he makes Sansa look at his burned face. He makes her look. Uh, and we get a description of Sandor's face and it is fucked up. He, the, the left side of his face is a ruin. Uh, one of his ears is missing. It's just a whole, his whole fucking bit. It's a massive scar. There's cracks. There's a hint of bone where the flesh had been seared away. Uh, at one point, he look he's like Two Face in Batman. This is some expensive CGI, is what this is, which is why the Hound in the show just looks like, you know, he's just blushing a bit hard. <laughs> you know, it's just like slightly redder. Well, no, that's not true, but it's certainly not as extreme as it is in the books. The Hound's scars, uh, and um, and and then the Hound tells the story of how he got the scar. So he talks about how when he was six or seven. Um, and Gregor was was five years older, which means Gregor was, uh, uh, oh, math, 11 or 12. Uh, and, and when Gregor was 11 or 12, he was six feet tall and muscled like an ox. What the fuck kind of hormonal pituitary chemistry is going on to make an 11-year-old six foot tall and muscled like an ox? What is he on Andre the this is he it's fucked up but 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 the hound you know the story the hound takes a toy off Gregor Gregor gets mad he grabs the head of his 6 year old brother and holds it down in the burning coals of a brazier and holds him there while he screams and screams and the hound talks about oh the nature of my suffering no one really knows suffering until you know my suffering and just the whole emo I, i've had it real hard but he also talks about the injustice element of it he talks about how well the mountain who is obviously a grade a cunt uh gets knighted and he's and he's said to be this valiant fucking great dude and he gets all these benefits from society meanwhile i I'm treated like shit, so where's the justice in that? So that's the Hound's kind of grievance. He feels like he's suffered, and he feels like the world is unjust. Yeah, you and everybody else, mate. Uh, and then Sansa feels sympathy for him. So maybe Sansa was being all sociopathic when Hugh died, but Sansa feels sympathy for this big, burned, angry man. Um, and she and she sort of reaches out to him and says, oh, and, and she sort of tries to console him in her sort of grasping way. Uh, which is a really nice thing to do to someone who is horrible, I would say. Uh, and then the hound just sort of growls at her, is like sort of. Eh. Um, but you know, obviously the hound gets something out of this emotionally because I mean, the very fact that the hound has opened up to Sansa like this uh, is pretty meaningful. He obviously had something he wanted to get off his chest here, uh, and he, and I think he appreciates Sansa's sympathy in some respect. But they walk back to the rest of the of the city in silence. Uh, and then he drops Sansa off, and he says, oh, by the way, if you tell anyone what I just told you, I'll fucking gut you, mate. Uh, which, 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 you know, has a sort of contrast tension going on there, isn't it? Like, if you say, if you're trying to act like a big, tough man, and I'll say, I'll fucking kill you with my fa- with my hands in, in your face, uh, that's sort of undermined a bit when you just gave a really sort of touching, harrowing tale about your own emotional insecurities. That's sort of, 
that I mean, odds is what that's at. I would say, uh, but I, but I think also like Sansa tries to promise. Oh, I promise I won't tell anyone, and and Sandor doesn't accept the promise because of course promises mean nothing to someone who feels so betrayed by society and by people. He can't. He feels like he can't trust people's words, which is why he's so emotionally detached and dependent on violence to solve his problems. It's the most base way to behave when the only way you feel you can influence other people's actions is by threatening murder that's kind of the last option you've got left uh so yeah that's the end of the chapter so thank you for listening to this episode of game of thrones abridged on old swift x this episode it was about the beauty and the glory and the naivety of youth and songs and high society being stripped away, and we see the other face, the other side of the of the two-face coin, the flipperoo, the coin, and then we see burnt, fucked up shit. We see the results of suffering. We see we see poor, not not merely poor parenting, but aggressive, drunken, dysfunctional, secretly incestuous parenting from Cersei and and, and Robert and Joffrey being this twisted up little monkey fucked up kid and then all the consequences of terrible behaviour manifesting in the suffering of the Hound and others. Two sides, two extremes and Sansa is beginning to peek behind the gold veil and see the other side which she will continue to do for the rest of her arc. Thanks for listening.